on October 3rd, my dad finally passed away from natural causes. And on October 7th, just a couple days ago, we had his funeral. So in this Real Talk Friday episode, I want to share with you some lessons that I learned from going through this experience. And before I say more, I just want to welcome you back to the Legendary Life Podcast. In case you don't know, my name is Ted Rice. I'm a coach, speaker. I work with high-performing professionals, executives, entrepreneurs. And what we do on the Legendary Life Podcast is we break down science-based information on how to lose fat, prevent disease, and live a longer, healthier, legendary life. But on Real Talk Fridays, we have a real conversation and I can't think of any more real conversation that we can have than about death, about mortality, about what we will all go through with our parents if we live long enough and what our children will go through. In fact, that's the natural cycle of things, isn't it? So. Not even sure how to kick this off, but I'll, I'll say it like this. I want to share a bit of the story in case you're, you're new to the show or, or missed a couple of the, the episodes. But my father's health has been declining over the past year. I've been in Asia for two years and came back at the end of 2019 only to find him. I, I came back with all these hopes about taking a trip and and doing some, spending some quality time only to find that he was really in bad shape. He was strung out on opiates. He was uh, suffering from these blisters that would burst and cause ulcers on his legs. And he was getting nurses coming in, taking care of him. And instead of becoming about Hey, dad, what are cool things we can do? Let's go to, let's go to eat at your favorite restaurant, Cobalt in the Vero Beach Hotel. I think it's called that anyway. Great restaurant, by the way, if you're ever in Vero Beach, Florida. And instead of it being about going out to eat, sharing meals, sharing conversations, planning trips together, because our, our business, my business has finally taken off to the point where we could do those things. It became about focusing on his health. And I, I spent a week with him, got things in order, then took off to Columbia, as many of you know, and spent from February 2nd, got there on my birthday until May 30th, when I got a call from my father that he was in the emergency room and not doing well. Even in spite of all the team of people that were coming to his place every week to help him. I rushed home, rushed back to see him that day, was on a flight uh, within a few days, a humanitarian flight. He was in the hospital for a while, couldn't even visit him, but he came out and he he was better. He went into a, a physical rehabilitation program after he was being treated for these these problems. Actually, uh, if you remember, he fell and spent nine hours on the ground. And in part, well, I'll just say this. He started doing better after he got into the hospital, after he was treated for a couple of weeks and then putting into the physical rehabilitation place for a couple of weeks. And I was staying in his house the entire time. I did episodes from there. I did coaching calls from there. And in case you don't know the story that led us to this point today, on uh, I was I was in Mexico because I needed a break after after spending so much of my time, my energy, and, and a substantial amount of money to help him get better, he was still struggling. And it was such emotional drain. Now, not only was it his health issues, but it was all the past. And we had gotten into arguments that I shared here. And, and things were starting to get better, but I really needed a break for myself. And that's what you've been hearing on the Real Talk Fridays when I talked about 
you know, smoking the DMT, doing the ayahuasca. I also was doing Muay Thai classes because I find that very therapeutic. I was also exercising a lot. I was also spending a lot of time connecting with new people. And I, I also did breathwork sessions with an incredible breathwork practitioner, not really sure what to call her, but named Sabine in Playa del Carmen, Mexico. And then I got another call. My dad was in the ER again after he had undergone a procedure to improve the circulation in his lower extremities, his lower legs, his calf area, if you will. And I rushed home the very next day. I rushed home. I got a flight that night to be home the very next day, to be back to see him in Vero Beach the very next day. And I got there, spent a couple, you know, hours collecting myself, then went to the hospital and spent a good four hours with him. And the way they made it seem is that your dad is going to die and he's going to die in the hospital. Now, nobody told me this explicitly. This is what I had to gather because the communication from the medical professionals, from the nurses, the doctors up until that point had been pretty poor. And I got there. My dad was struggling to make sense he was uh, not, he, he doesn't suffer from Alzheimer's, but he was suffering from liver failure, from kidney failure. And apparently his kidneys, which if you, if you're not aware, your kidneys filter toxins out of your body. It, they also filter uh, pharmaceuticals, the medications he was taking out of his body and they weren't doing a good job. And that's why his legs were swelling. And that's why the blisters were happening. And that's why they were bursting and causing a lot of pain. He also had a bone infection on the right leg. It was just a, a bad situation. And his body were, was starting to swell up, not just his legs, but his abdomen was swelling. And it seems like, by the way, just want to throw this out there, that something happened in the rehab hospital that he had gone to. Same one that he was in before that I mentioned earlier. He went back to that after the procedure for his lower extremities. And they may have given him a drug that was inappropriate for his kidney situation, his kidney disease, or maybe a dose of a drug. Looking into that to figure out what exactly happened, but couldn't focus on that because here, here we were in the hospital. And, and back to what I was saying, he was having trouble understanding me and also speaking because it was just affecting his brain. The, the, the medications were affecting his brain. So it was affecting him cognitively, but I stayed there and I stayed there for hours with him. They were supposed to only allow me to visit once and for one hour because of the COVID situation. I don't need to tell you we're all dealing with it in one way or another. Some of us more than others, depending on where we live. And I thought that was the last time I was going to see my dad and we have the best conversations we could under, uh, under those circumstances. And then it started to become clear that that wasn't exactly the case. And I ended up speaking to his doctor and his doctor said, well, listen, we're planning on discharge, but it's, it's going to be a situation where he's going to have to get dialysis because his kidneys are no longer working. And if he doesn't do that, he's not going to last long. He's not going to be alive for long because you can't live without functioning kidneys and <laughs> obviously not a candidate for kidney donation, kidney. Oh, I can't even think of the word right now. It's not called organ replacement. Anyway, not a candidate for that. So he was either going to get dialysis, I'm going to continue this treatment, this dialysis until the end of his days, if it even worked for him, which wasn't even clear. And they let me back in the hospital. We had some conversations and my dad, the, the reasoning was, the way they explained it was that if your dad only had the liver, I'm sorry, the kidney issues, maybe that dialysis, maybe you could make an argument for it, but he was in severe chronic pain because of arthritis. He was in pain in his back and his knee. Uh, he had a bone infection on his right leg. And if he was going to live, he would live in a hospital bed, whether that's in the hospital or whether that's at home, but he was never going to walk again. He had lost so much muscle. He had lost so much strength. Recovery at that point was just, it just wasn't going to be possible. And undergoing the dialysis three times a week 
although it's a 15 minute procedure and it's not painful per se, but it takes a lot out of you is what they said. So we had a talk about what he wanted to do. And my dad was done. He had been suffering enough. He had suffered a lot in life with the loss of my brother who was kidnapped and murdered. His wife, my stepmother, who died of a heart attack, and my sister who committed suicide, he had suffered a lot in life. He had had colon cancer earlier in life before Jim, my, my younger, my youngest or younger brother, uh, before that tragedy and, um, was a workaholic and alcoholic, which brings me to my first lesson, which is health is the greatest wealth. Such a cliche and like, yeah, 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 for sure. But I feel that now. I saw it in action. I saw my mortality. I saw where I could end up if I didn't, even with all the exercise that I do now, if I don't change my ways and start to handle my health in a a more proactive way. My dad got to the point where he could continue to live, but didn't want to because of the amount of issues he he had, the amount of chronic diseases. It was liver disease, congestive heart failure, kidney disease, osteoarthritis, a bone infection, no quality of life. And if you are like me and you look at how long we live these days and you see like there's a good chance of us making it into the 80s, or 90s or you know even beyond that i've had longevity experts talk about how 100 or 120 is you know that's something that's totally doable but the question that we don't ask enough is are we going to get there are we going to be with, with, with able to enjoy life able to do the things that we want to play with our Children or grandchildren, probably at that point, probably not playing with your children anymore. If you're 80 years old, your 40 or 50 year old children might not (laughs) be up for that. Uh, But are you going to be a contributing member to your family? Are you going to be able to enjoy your life? Because if you don't have your health, you have nothing. And if you're trading it right now so that you can make more money in the hopes that when you're in your 50s, 60s, 70s, you'll really start to start to focus on it. It's going to be too late. There's a good chance it'll be too late. It's a good chance that you'll have a chronic condition. It's a good chance that if you're like, okay, well, now I'm going to start to take things seriously. I'm not saying this to dissuade you from taking action. Now, if you're already in that situation, take action. What I'm saying is the older you are, the harder it gets. If you start now, it's the time. And the thing that I personally took away from this, even though I spend a lot of time on on my health, I exercise, I do some other things, but I'm struggling with, uh, I struggle with some injuries from doing too much exercise, which is something if you're a bit like me and you use exercise or, or I don't do this anymore, but if you use exercise, especially intense exercise as an outlet or play sports as an outlet, and your hip is aching or your low back is aching or your shoulders aching, or maybe you got some arthritis here and there. It doesn't get better with age. It gets worse unless you are proactive about it. And right now, after my, <laughs> after my dad's funeral, I'm, I've just made an appointment with a physical therapist, something I've been meaning to do for a while. I'm going to do a colonoscopy, which people have been bothering me about for a long time. So even me, who's in this, for a long time and, and who's on top of their health and, and really in quite good health, minus the injuries and, and uh, arthritis that I struggle with, I'm still, I can do better. And, and I don't say that to put pressure on myself or to hold myself to society standards or someone else else's standards or, you know, some ridiculous standard. It, it simply comes down to this. If I don't do it, I see that the chronic the, the issues that I have now are going to become such a problem that they're going to stop me from doing the things that I want to keep doing in my life. Traveling, connecting with others, chronic pain, if you're dealing with it through whatever, for whatever reason, it's such a common cause of disability. So whatever I want to ask you right now, what are you struggling with? Because we're all struggling with something if we're alive long enough. Is it your knees are kind of achy? Do you have a quote unquote bad back? 
do you have a gut where you haven't seen what's <laughs> underneath your gut in a while? Having trouble getting around, you walk up and down the stairs and have to grip the railing. Are you diabetic or pre-diabetic? Are your cholesterol out of levels out of whack? What are you struggling with? Because those things that you're struggling with right now, they're going to get worse. The reality is that we all die, but some of us die in truly horrific fashion. My dad died in a hospice bed in pain, physically, mental anguish, which brings me to my second lesson here, which is, yeah, you've got one chance to do life right. And I want to ask you, are you doing life right? And not by right by me or someone else's standards or your parents' standards or society's standards, but by your standards, are you doing your best? And if the answer is yes, because you're in such a down and out position, you really need help to do better cool. But if you're making, if you're middle class and up, are you living the life where you wake up to go to work, you sit in your job 40 hours a week, staring at a computer screen or something similar, working in a business, working for someone, even if owning a business. And I would ask you, do you, you know, coming home from that, eating food, and watching movies, not even going out to the movies these days, but binge watching Netflix series or Amazon or even, you know, been watching a series on Apple TV. There's nothing wrong with any of that. It's just, are you really living life? Are you, if you died tomorrow, could you on your deathbed look back at what you've done with your relationships in your life, with your, partner, your husband, wife, whatever, boyfriend, girlfriend, your relationships with your children, your relationships with your parents, if they're still alive. Are you doing it right? Or are you not? Are you, do you feel like, do you know you could do better and you're just not doing it because you're stuck in some patterns of behavior that you haven't been able to break out of? One is, oh, I'll handle that later. And later has become later, which becomes later. And then all of a sudden it's weeks go to months, go to years. You still have that problem. And the three big areas, by the way, are health, relationships, and career slash finances. So the three biggest areas that impact our lives. And for me, I want to share this with you. I want to, fo- I'm going to start focusing on my health more especially my psychological health and healing from some of the traumas that I've been through. I'm going to be sharing that on Real Talk Fridays and getting expert interviews to talk about these things. I'm doing physical therapy. I've already got an appointment. I've got a whole thing, whole plan rather, to take it to the next level. I also have a plan to contribute more. I've been so, not stuck, but I've been so focused on helping my father which was the right thing to do. I have no regrets about it. I'm so grateful that I made enough money to help him financially. I'm so grateful that I had enough freedom with what I do to go and spend time with him. And I'm so grateful that I also have worked on myself enough to know when I was getting hurt, when I was giving too much and needed to focus back on myself to bring myself back into balance. I'm so grateful that I have the opportunity and the mindset that brings us to our third lesson is to invest in myself. And the lesson is invest in yourself. One thing I'll tell you, my dad had some great experience in in life, no doubt. But as the trauma built up, as the losses built up and the sadness built up, and the people in his life who he cared about, his, his wife, his uh, you know daughter, actually he lost a friend recently to lung cancer. As the people started going away in his life, he started to invest in more in buying things instead of experiences, instead of healing. And the truth about his situation is this, he couldn't have done better. He did his best. He really did. And on his 
hospital bed, almost his deathbed. He said, I should have been stronger. I wish I was stronger. I should have been stronger. And I said, dad, you're strong as fuck. Strength was never an issue for you. Look at what you've accomplished with, uh, in case you don't know, my parents, after my brother was kidnapped and murdered, started the Jimmy Rice Center, which donates bloodhounds to law enforcement officers, law enforcement um, uh, <laughs> don't, departments, I guess. And I met so many of them at his funeral. They brought the dogs and everything. It was incredible meeting those people, those officers that uh, are a new type of officer, really. They're not just about catching bad guys, but finding good ones who go missing. Such a great organization, one that I'm going to help keep going. But the issue was that he didn't invest in in himself enough. One of the things that we realized towards the end is like, dad, you need some therapy. It's like, you know, you should take better care of your health, but you're not doing it. And if you can't do it on your own, that means you need to ask for help. It's a psychological problem. And I would say this to you. So many of us, we think, oh, well, I'm going to just tough this out. It's the wrong way of doing it, guys. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. It's the bullshit way of doing it. I don't need therapy. I've got this. Okay, then why are you in debt? Why are you overweight? Why, why do you show up? You're in your family and you feel like you can't connect with other people because of what you've been through, because of a trauma you've been through. It's bullshit. Let's be honest and judge on results. And so many of us, what we do instead of investing in healing from trauma, instead of investing in working with someone to help us with our health, instead of investing in marriage counseling, instead of those things, what will, what will we do? Let's buy a new car. And you get so excited about buying the car. You do your research. You look for the best deal. Finally get it. So amazing, except it goes away because you don't really give a fuck about the new car that much. And guess what? Nobody cares either. Doesn't matter. Even if you're driving the newest Ferrari, nobody really cares that much. And you, the, the truth about that, by the way, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who drove very expensive cars. I took a ride in an $8 million Ferrari, 1969 Ferrari, an antique Ferrari. Guess what? It's just a car. Actually, it wasn't even that, wasn't even that comfortable one. Same guy also had the new Ferrari, the Spider or whatever the hell it was. And it's nice, but it's just a car. You get in it. It's fun. Then you get out. And I'm not saying don't buy cars. Don't buy nice cars or if you like nice cars, that that's an issue. What I'm saying is material things, whether it's a nice car, whether it's a house, whether it's clothes, whether it's a watch, whether it's a purse, whether it's shoes, it never gives us the big emotional payoff that we're looking for, that so many of us are looking for. Yeah, you get a compliment here and there, but it's really just bullshit. It's bullshit. I lived it. I've seen other people live it at a high level. Buy a, you know, hundred thousand dollar piece of art. Okay, cool. It's just another piece of art in your house. Maybe if there's a story of adventure behind it and experience behind it, but if all you did was get your ass up, go to Art Basel in Miami Beach, look around for a few moments, say, Oh, that would look nice and write a check or whatever. Use your black American express card, whatever, however you might roll really doesn't fucking matter. Just another thing. And I was reminded of this as I'm cleaning out my dad's place. That some of the one thing that you really don't get to that nobody really tells you about, but you got to clean up all the shit from someone who dies. If it's your parents. Now I don't have to, I guess I could have just left it there, but it's a responsibility and some things, you know, I needed his documents and I wanted to give away some of this stuff, but he had a bunch of wallets. He had a bunch of computers. He had way more than he needed. And it was so obvious what he was doing was trying to buy happiness. Oh, I'll just buy this thing. It'll make me bring me some happiness. And I used to be that way. And I've told this story when I was in Miami Beach, I really wanted more respect from other people. So I invested in my style. I I was wearing the, you know, $300 $300 jeans and the $200 shorts and the, you know, $200 shoes or even more. I, I, I have thousands of dollars. So funny. One of the things that I've been going through recently is 
all my wardrobe from Miami Beach, thousands of dollars worth of clothes, worth of shoes, a couple leather jackets that I can't even really even wear very often here in Miami or South Florida in general. So it hardly ever gets cold. And it was me trying to become cooler, me trying to invest in happiness, trying to improve my experience. Do you resonate with that at all? Do you do a little bit of it? Of course you do. If you're American, probably do a lot of it. But the, at the end of the day, nobody really cares. Oh, you look a little nicer, but how do you feel on the inside? And that's why I'm, I'm a minimalist now. I mean, I'm interested in, in buying things and having a place and buying things to, to put in that place. But even more important right now is the experiences because experiences change us as a person. When I do therapy and I invest money in that, I'm investing money in myself. When I invest in physical therapy, I'm investing money in myself. When I invest in travel, not going to some all-inclusive resort where I just stay trash the entire time, like I might have done in my 20s or early 30s, but when I go and travel and experience the culture, take in the culture, meet the people, see the history, it changes me as a person. And which brings me to my fourth lesson, which is the only way to change others is by changing yourself. And I want to ask you right now, are you a person who's looking around and pointing the finger? Oh, it's Trump that's created this problem. Oh, it's the left that's created this problem. Oh, it's Biden that's created this problem. Oh, it's my wife that's created my, you know, the issues in my life. It's my husband that's created the issues in my life. It's my parents that have created the issues in my life. It's the, it's my children that are creating so much stress for me. It's my coworkers. It's my boss. It's my employees. And you want them to change because you know, if they would change, your experience would be different. However, the truth is this. You can't sit down and explain someone their behavior and expect them to change. No more than you can listen to this podcast and have a transformation in your life by listening to an episode. Not going to happen. Perhaps if you've li- listened to for this, <laughs> I can't even speak English. Perhaps if you've been listening for years, it slowly seeped in my story, my journey, the experts I've interviewed, the things I've shared, the evolution that you've experienced along with me has made a difference for you, but any one episode is not going to make a difference. The only way to change other people is by changing ourselves, And that's, I'll, I'll share the story. One of the reasons I, again, that I left the Playa del Carmen, Mexico is because I was stuck in a negative pattern with my dad. He was stressed out. I was stressed out. Every time we got together, it was, we both wanted, we both love each other. We both wanted a better experience when we got together, but we were stuck in this negative pattern. So I went to Mexico and instead of, you know, just buying stuff or going out to eat a lot, which I did some, I invested in relationships with people there. I met people. I hung out, had conversations, real conversations. I went cave diving. I challenged myself with something quite scary. I (laughs) challenged myself by doing an ayahuasca session. I challenged myself by doing a breathwork session. And I, I remember after a breathwork, my first breathwork session, my dad called me. He, he FaceTimed me, which is unusual for him. And he was in the hospital and it was about 1030 my time and about 1130 his, which is quite late. And I answered. And I was eating a frozen banana, which by the way, if you like ice cream and like bananas, but you know that ice cream has a lot of calories, free, unpeel a banana or a bunch of them rather, put them in a Ziploc bag and throw them in the freezer. They are delicious. So after this breathwork session, I answered the FaceTime call from my dad and he started with his same pattern. Oh, Ted, I'm, oh, this is going on. That's going on. I'm in the hospital. He's in his hospital bed talking to me about stuff. And instead of me getting triggered and getting in that same loop with him, I said, Dad, I hear you, but we can talk about that stuff tomorrow. It's a little bit late. Tell me, how are you doing right now? How's it going? And it wasn't just what I said, but how I said it. And even, I forget exactly when he told me during that conversation, but he looked at me, he's like, oh, 
oh, you look good. Like what I took that to mean is that that pattern of behavior that we were in where he was ang- he was triggered and I was triggered and that whole dance that we were doing, I was no longer a willing partner in it. And so he had to start dancing with me on my, I'm starting to lose the metaphor here, but he started, ha- he started changing because I changed. He couldn't do it. And most people who we want to change can't. It is up to us. And how we change ourselves is something that I've focused a lot on this, uh, focused a lot on uh, in these podcast episodes. And I'm going to focus on even more. I think it's so important, so necessary. Mo- so many people are so triggered, losing sight of what matters, arguing about politics when it's like, well, is this more important than the 2000 election? Even if it is, in 10 years, you're going to be looking back. It was just another election that you lived through. And even though it matters, it's the day-to-day stuff that you do in your life every day that matters most. Are you in debt, living month to month? Are you making a million a year, but spending you know a million five a year? Are you successful in business, but your kids hate you? Your wife or husband is not, not a fan either. You know, like these are the things that really matter. So to change others, to change how others treat us, we must change ourselves. Something that, again, I'm not trying to convince you of any of this. I challenge you to test it out on your own and prove it wrong. And the last thing I'll say and the last lesson I'll share is that be happy now. So many of us are so distracted from what matters. Does the election matter more than your relationship with your children? We say family first. Do your children matter more than your work? Do you sacrifice yourself and you're overweight and unhealthy and unhappy and you do it all because you're doing it for your children? But what your children really need and what your children really get is they don't see your sacrifice. What they see is a person who doesn't value themselves and that's what they end up copying or that's what they end up having it working against later on in life. So I'll tell you this, the last lesson is to be happy now. There's a great quote by a Tibetan Buddhist monk or nun, not quite sure <laughs> at the moment, don't remember. Her name's Pema Chodron. And what she said was, if death is certain, but the time of death is uncertain, in, you know, for us, what's really important now? And these are just words and it sounds clever, sounds right, but I got to experience this with my father. And at the end, what I can tell you is this, what mattered most to him, a person who watched Fox News religiously, who wanted to talk about politics and how things were going wrong all the time, would want to focus on the negative things all the time. Guess what? All that got taken away when he knew he was going to die. What was most important to him is spending time with me, that I showed up for him in his last moments, that I did my best to help him financially, time-wise. Those are the things that mattered most to him. He wanted to know that I was going to be okay after he was gone. That's what mattered most to him. It's so interesting to see the change because he would watch Fox News religiously, like I said. But you know what he wanted to watch when he was in the hospital? Wasn't the news, even though he had access to it. In fact, I was like, do you want to watch the news? So, I mean, he's on his, he's on the tail end of life here, the, the very end. Days away from death. What, what, whatever he wants, happy to give him. You know what he wanted to watch? He wanted to watch ESPN. And I didn't get a chance to ask him why. <laughs> and it was a baseball game, which he was not particularly fan of baseball, but he, he was happy to watch it. And what I would say is this. It reminded him of a time. I mean, if you would ask me, well, why did he want to watch that? What was the change there? What was it? I would say it reminded him of a happier time, reminded him of what was really important. 
sports isn't just about a score on the scoreboard. It's about being with other people. It's about moving your body and having the ability to do that. There's no politics. There's no talk. There's just being present in the moment. So I would ask you, what do you need to be happy now? What can you take action on that can make you happy now? What can get you present in the moment? What can get you better connected to the people who you really care about in life? What can get you better connected to yourself? What can put you, we talk a lot about the relationship with food, but you know what the relationship with food is really about? The relationship with ourselves, who we choose to let in our life, who we choose to spend time with, how we choose to spend our time and what we get back for how we spend our time. Nothing wrong with watching shows. I'm on top of all of them, (laughs) but I don't prioritize them over connections with other people. I don't prioritize them over having experiences that make life worth living. My dad didn't talk about, hey, you know, I'm really glad I watched those series. He didn't mention any series. He didn't mention the politics. It was just talking about him, talking about life, talking about the people in his life, seeing who would really show up for him at the end. It was about his career. He was super passionate about his career and doing well by the people who hired him. He was very grateful to do the work as an arbitrator after he stopped practicing law. In fact, to the dairy, almost to the very end, he was trying to work and very proud of, of, uh, he was, his business was actually picking up as he was slipping away, as his life was slipping away. That was his purpose in life. That was his way to contribute. And he was amazing at it. So what do you need to do to give yourself more purpose if that's what you need? Or what do you feel you need to be happy now, to get you present in the moment now? We'll be talking about these things more, but I wanted to share this with you, share my thoughts after of of an emotional roller coaster of a week. So I'll leave you now, but I just want to say, please focus on what really matters. Please prioritize your happiness, prioritize yourself. You want the world to be a better place. You want your children to be better than they are. You want your partner to be better than they are. You want your employees, you want your boss, you want whoever. No one's going to come and change. You've got to be the leader. And you listen to this podcast because you are a leader. So love yourself. I love you. Have an amazing weekend and I'll speak to you soon.